Welcome everyone. Nice to see you all again. Okay, perfect. So I think we are good to get started. Um, so welcome, welcome to Founder Fundamentals. This is our final event in the series and we're so excited about it. Um, and it, it's been a really, really great series so far. Um, for those of you who don't know, my name is Diana Senwasane and I am the Marketing and Events Coordinator for LaunchU, uh, which is York University's Entrepreneurship Unit. Um, so over the past three months, actually, we've held 11 workshops, uh, including this one today, um, really to help you build your knowledge and skills to help you start your business. Um, and we'd like to really thank you for continuing to join us each and every week um, and, and learning with us, really. Um, I do want to mention that York University has so many programs to support entrepreneurs and specifically Innovation York Entrepreneurship uh, provides programs, workshops, events, and space to help entrepreneurs build and launch their ventures. Um, it is home to York University's LaunchU, which is us, the Eller Accelerator for Women, as well as Yspace. Now, this workshop series, Founder Fundamentals, has become a community stapled, and it's really designed to help entrepreneurs build and launch their startup. Uh, this is what was actually the first time that LaunchU hosted the series, um, and we've been really excited to introduce it to audience members really from around the world. Um, in fact, if you can type in your location right now to let us know where you are joining us from, uh, that would be great because I know we do have lots of members from outside of Canada uh, joining us today. I'm just going to have a look at the chat to see where everyone is typing in. So we've got India, we've got Toronto, Markham, Chicago, Milton, New York, Brampton, Caledon, California, Indonesia, um, more people from India, Montreal, um, Philly. Oh, that's so great to see so many people. Again, um, really the Founder Fundamental series has had an international reach. Um, which is so amazing to see um, each and every time. So really, really happy um, to have you all join us today. Um, now, although the sessions are completely virtual, they are really meant to provide a hands-on approach um, to and provide you resources to help you really launch your business. Um, and those of you who have attended at least nine of the workshops will receive an Innovation York uh, Certificate of Recognition. Um, so we are going to be emailing out their certificates in December to everyone who attended at least nine of the workshops. Um, so there's no need for you to do anything. We have tracked your attendance in Zoom, um, so you should be receiving your certificate electronically. Now, I do want to mention that the series could not be possible with the help of so many people working behind the scenes. Um, so I do want to introduce David Kwok, who is our Associate Director of Entrepreneurship. He will be in the chat to help you and assist you uh, with any questions that you may have, um, and he's always here to help. Uh, David has also worked really hard in helping bring the series to life and, you know, helping source all of the amazing facilitators that we've had so far. Um, so thank you so much, David, for helping us with that. I also do want to take a moment to thank our partners, the Markham Small Business Center, uh, for really providing their support uh, with the entire series. Um, and I do want to mention that um, we do have uh, their manager, Don, here who will actually say a few words about the Markham Small Business Center. Hey, Don. Thanks, Diana. And thanks everyone for sort of sticking with us through the entire series. Um, you've heard from me before, you've heard from my other colleagues, Linda and Tiffany, um, but just for anyone who's joining us for the first time, uh, the Small Business Center at the city of Markham provides advisory and educational services to entrepreneurs in the community. Um, and we're part of a network of entrepreneurship services across the province. So if you are looking for help with business planning or understanding regulations and requirements as you get started, um, marketing and other strategy elements, feel free to connect with us. It's a government service offered at no cost. And we've actually caught a, uh, got a couple of grant programs underway for uh, both student businesses and anyone who's uh, pursuing their business full time. Um, I, I just want to make one quick uh, shout out. Um, you know, uh, just recently, uh, actually just yesterday, the, the city announced a, an interesting partnership with um, Skip the Dishes and we're, we've been telling, uh, telling residents to buy local, buy local um, and sort of 
making that message very clear. Um, but Skip has now stepped up to offer free deliveries um, for any orders. And I, I'm just saying this as a way to, you know, A, uh, encourage you to shop local, but secondly, um, let you know that, you know, we're working behind the scenes to get some interesting offerings out. And so if you're in the Markham area and uh, you're feeling hungry, please order something. Um, the, the, the promotions going through all of the holidays, we want you to, um, to, to buy from local Markham businesses. And uh, I just really wanted to um, just say how, how difficult the, the past seven months have been. Um, but I think with everybody's support, we're gonna continue to do well and, and thrive. And um, it was an amazing partnership to be able to pitch that. Um, so yeah, you skip the dishes, get something from a local and, and get free delivery on, on your orders. So that's my plug for the Markham restaurant community um, for today. Thanks. Thanks, Don. Um, so yeah, I do wanna mention that for this series, uh, sorry, for this workshop event that we have today, um, if you have any questions, you can feel free to type them in the chat box at any time. Uh, for questions in regards to the actual story, um, you can, we will address them throughout the presentation, but for anything related to pitching, uh, your question will actually may be answered throughout the presentation. So we may be addressing them uh, towards the end. Um, again, if you have any questions, you can always type them in the chat box. Um, now I would like to welcome our speaker. So our speaker, Jalisa, is the founder of Tony Marlowe Clothing. And uh, she's got tons of experience in, in pitching and storytelling. Um, and, and she's gonna be really sharing with that, us, with sharing that with us today. So thank you so much, Julissa, for joining us. And I'll hand it off to you. Oh, well, happy to be here. Thanks for having me. And uh, you know, again, a big shout out to David. Um, you know, it was really great to connect in school. So it's nice to, you know, come full circle and be able to work together and support each other. Um, and I'm just blown away that there's so many people from literally all over the world. I've seen people from like Australia, like it's, that's wild. That's really nice. So thank you all for joining in and having, um, having me here. Um, so yeah, I'm going to be speaking to you about uh, storytelling and pitching. Um, I don't know why I won't click. Sorry, one quick second. So yeah, we're just going to do a quick intro. I like to know who I'm, you know, working with. If you guys feel free to share a little bit about yourselves, it'll just take a couple minutes. Um, and then I'll go through some of my pitch experiences, lessons learned, and then the big question that everyone freaks out about, you know, what do I put in my pitch? Um, and then just give you actual tangible tips, as you said, you know, it's supposed to be a very practical hands-on approach. Um, so I'll give you that for the actual content, what your slides should look like, and actually presenting. Um, and I'll show you one of my most recent pitches and, um, and then we can have Q&A. I just have one question. Are you seeing my whole screen or just the presentation? We see the presentation. Okay, are you seeing the little Zoom window pop up on the side? Nope. No, okay, cool, great. I can still see you guys then, perfect. Okay, uh, does that work for everybody? Great. So as uh, Diana said, my name is Julissa Lucas Mendez. My pronouns are they, them. I'm the founder of Tony Marlowe Clothing, which I hope you can see. I just opened the link, but are you you're still on the presentation? Yep, we see the link, the website. Okay, great. okay cool. Um, just to give people a sense, because sometimes people are like, oh, underwear, big deal. But, you know, our brand is really about inclusivity in body shape, gender, size, um, and functionality. So we're known for um, you know, underwear for people who redefine gender norms. So that includes period boxers, packer boxers, and, uh, you know, boy shorts for women, trans men, and non-binary people assigned female at birth. And we donate $1 of every product sold to suicide prevention. Um, yeah, I'm a speaker, a small business and youth entrepreneurship consultant. I'm wildly passionate about ice cream and French bulldogs. Uh, apologies in advance, I do have a puppy who is happily snoring right now, but he may wake up and cause a little trouble later. Um, and so as I said, um, you know, feel free if some people can tell me a little bit about yourselves or if you guys, if the hosts want to maybe highlight any, um, any uh, participants, any of their businesses or anything, just to get a sense of, you know, the type of people we have in the, in the room today. Anyone want to share? Feel free to unmute your mic. Yeah, just go for it. 
Hi, I'd like to share. Okay, great. Oh, fantastic. Hi, nice to see you. It's nice. awesome. I'm glad I could be home. And uh, my husband just went out to pick up the groceries. <laughs> <laughs> um, my name is June Swatzel. I'm in Eastern Washington. And uh, I'm alpha testing our MVP. We created a website where uh, you can find your lo uh, fresh, local, and organic food products uh, wherever you live. And uh, it's going to have the, all the local farms listed. Um, it's, and we'll, second iteration, we'll be scraping the grocery sites for their uh, organic food and um, farmers just don't, local farmers don't have uh, a way of really marketing online, people finding their products. And um, this, this is a unique site. I've worked three years on it and uh, I'm very excited about finally having um, an MVP to test. And I bootstrapped it and I have about $500 invested. Nice. And my daughter gave me the money. <laughs> what an awesome daughter. I know. It's great that you have that family support. And thank you for sharing. I just, it really adds to the, you know, the feel of the event when you get to interact with some of the participants. Um, congratulations, like going on, you know, for three years to work on a project is, is a big commitment, mm -hmm. like kudos to sticking it out. Cause that's honestly almost half of the battle is just the perseverance to keep going. Um, and, you know, I appreciate that you're doing something that's good for, you know, people and the planet and as well as entrepreneurs. So congrats and thanks for sharing. Thank you. Okay, great. So I'm just gonna, that was, thank you. I, I would actually sit here all day and talk to everyone. If you've been to any of my other uh, events, you know that I, I truly do, but I'm going to respect the time of launch you. Um, so just a little background about myself outside of Tony Merlot, uh, my startup experiences. Um, my first business was that I launched was called Proof It Rentals. I did that while I was in university. It was a rating and review site for landlords and tenants. Then I went to do um, Tony Marlowe. And as David said, I kind of, you know, I have ADHD. I'm, you know, I focus on one thing, but there's always a little something else going on in the background. So now that Tony Marlowe pretty much stands on its own, I am uh, started a new business called Noir Now. And our first product is called Shop Black First. And it's a Chrome extension that allows consumers to find black owned businesses in just two clicks. Um, so we're at the place right now where we're building out our, our beta. Um, so you're welcome to, you know, check us out. Our website is noirnow.com and you can join our wait list um, either to join as a consumer to download it and test it out or as a black owned business to see how it works and if you get more traffic and things like that. So as David has mentioned, I've done several pitches in my, in my time, but these are some of the significant ones, the more significant ones I want to highlight. So, you know, Canadian um, export challenge with startup Canda, um, AfroChic, Slate. Uh, I don't think it's even called that anymore, but uh, Ryerson has a $25,000 business competition that I did while I was in school, branded TO as well as Venture Out. So during this part, um, feel free to ask any questions and I believe Diana will, um, will share them. Um, so these are really more like storytelling aspects. And so please, I'm, I'm here for all the questions. So of course, this is a five pitches um, and that's only some of them, that's not all I've done. You would imagine that I didn't win all of them, um, but I'm still mentioning them. And so on this page, I've actually only won two of these pitches and one of them was first place. So you're probably wondering like, okay, if you don't win the pitch and you've done it a few times, like why continue pitching? Um, and that is actually where I had started to feel at some point in time, but there are many reasons. One is just practice. It seems obvious, but some people forget it. The more you pitch, the more you practice, the better you, you get at it and you learn the little spots where you can improve. So you have better chance next time. Um, and that, you know, in the practice comes feedback. You're going to get different questions 
from the, the judges and the audiences. And that sometimes leads you to more, um, not just opportunities, but even ideas on how you can do things better, um, as well as exposure, right? It's just another chance to let more people know what you're doing. Sometimes I'll do an event that I know isn't gonna necessarily, I'm not gonna come out on top per se, but I'm like, this is a chance to talk to however many people at once instead of individually trying to get to the same amount of people. Just want to do a quick check-in. Is this pace okay for everyone? Cool. Um, yeah, so also, of course, gaining confidence. It all kind of ties together. The more you're practicing, the more feedback you're getting, the better you're getting at answering your questions, the more people are seeing you and giving you, hey, that was great, or what have you considered that? Can I connect you here? The more confident you're going to feel so that when you do go to a pitch that you really want, you know, you're like, this is it, I got to get it, or this is a great opportunity, I think I have a chance, you're going to feel very solid in your abilities. Um, also, sometimes you don't win that pitch itself, but you'll get another offer from it. So someone might offer to be your intern, someone might offer to, you know, subcontract, connect you to the right person, or just invest on their own that has nothing to do with the pitch, um, as well as you get marketing assets. We all know in terms of branding, social media, you have to get stuff out. So pitching is also just another chance to get you in action and, you know, help promote and boost, you know, the uh, image of your brand. Any questions there so far? Cool. So lessons learned. Um, just gonna move this. There we go. So I mean, <laughs> every day is a lesson. Every pitch, it's something different. But you know, with Slate, I was in my second last year of university. I was pitching for Proof It Rentals. I thought I had a great pitch. Um, you know, the audience seemed to really like it. A lot of our mentors that were there thought it was great. We nailed it. Um, I spoke to the judges after and they were like, yeah, you almost won, but like I didn't win. And I was like, I don't understand. What did I do wrong? And I was pretty crushed about it, um, but I learned a lot. You know, one, how to calm my nerves when I'm pitching. Um, also in terms of what I put in my pitches, especially when it comes to technology. The main thing, they loved everything about the idea, the presentation, all of that, but they weren't clear or confident on the revenue model. And so my biggest takeaway from that competition was if I'm going to do something with technology to make sure there are other revenue streams that do not rely solely on advertising, and that in general, no matter what, always make my revenue model as clear as possible, as early as possible. So fast forward a few years, um, I was pitching at Branded TO. Uh, that's a competition here in Toronto, mostly for um, Black and POC um, entrepreneurs, youth. And it's, it's a really great event. You get to like, it's like conference, hands-on, mentors, all of that, as well as the final uh, big pitch. And so this was a really, really interesting experience. I was one of five who made it to the final round and they gave us like a, you know, an hour, two hour session with a professional um, consultant who went through our, our pitches, gave us feedback and told us how we can tighten up. And they had prepared us on five minutes. So I was all set to go for a five minute pitch. And you can imagine I'm talking to, yeah, I don't know everyone who's in this group, but you can imagine talking to, uh, you know, a predominantly black crowd about LGBTQ issues. It's a lot better now, but it's still not perfect. And it's always kind of like, I'm not too sure how it's gonna be received. Even though it's just underwear, it, it always has that layer to it. And so I had been comfortable and confident in my five minutes, keeping that in mind, all of that. And when I get to the, the event, it's, you know, it's half, I think it was a quarter of the weight was on audience votes and the rest was on judges. So first of all, I get there and we find out that the pitch is not actually five minutes, it's two minutes. So we're all like, what? <laughs> like, that's a big jump to, you know, go back from. And how do you nail that down while you only are, you're going to go on in 
five to 15 minutes, depending what number participant you are. So I'm pretty stressed in the sense of it's a lot of information to get across. It has to be delivered in a particular way for this audience. Um, and then on top of it, I noticed that some of the other contestants were cheating. They were texting their friends saying, vote now, vote now, vote now. And you could see by the end, like it was a visual bar. You could see my name in there and a couple other names. The one that was cheating was going up and down. And I was like, what the hell? And so it was just like, what do you do in this situation, right? So, so many different emotions going on. But, um, you know, I just really was like, I'm not going to cheat. I'm not going to rat on the person. We're just going to see what happens because this is one of many pitches. I did a great job and there's more than just the first prize. And I'm glad I did do that. Um, so to finish the story, I kind of went off a little bit, but to bring it full circle, how we ended up from going from a five minute pitch to a two minute pitch was there was a miscommunication and the person who won had noticed that change in detail in an email. Meanwhile, the rest of us didn't notice it. And he had called in to find out, hey, you know, which one is it? So he had the accurate, most up-to-date information where the rest of us had to adapt on the spot. And you know what? I think that was a great lesson because you never know when you're going to pitch. You just never do. Sometimes, like I remember one time I was pitching an investor and I didn't even know. My friend was like, oh, this is my friend from so-and-so. Uh, I just wanted to let you meet each other, tell him about your, your business. And I did. And then he was like, oh, I'm an investor. I'm interested in like having a proper conversation. If you're not prepared knowing what your business is, you're not able to adapt, you're going to lose out on those kinds of opportunities. So this event really brought that back to me and you know I'm really grateful for it. Um, so yeah, I ended up coming up in second place. Uh, we have a great relationship still, the, that organization and myself. Um, it was a great time. And again, just to reiterate, the main lessons I took away from that was detail. <laughs> Read your emails in detail, especially anything that's pertaining to contest or accessing funding. Um, you know, I know we can get overwhelmed when we're running things on our own and you have to prioritize your emails, but anything that has to do with money um, or deadlines, but specifically money, just make sure you really have the, you take the time to read it over where you can focus and, and highlight the details and make sure you're clear. And don't be shy to call and confirm. If there's a discrepancy and you're like, wait, what's going on? You should call and confirm. Um, and then lastly, you know, as I said, always having various versions of your pitch memorized, ready to go. So now what I do is I have a five minute, a two minute and my 60 second pitch always ready. Um, so wherever I'm at, if I get an opportunity, I'm good to go. I, I try to do my best to always stay prepared. I said a lot there um, and I saw the, the bubble coming up a bit. Are there any questions, Diana, that maybe we wanna address at this point? I can't see you. Sorry, right. Sorry I was on mute. No, I don't see any questions so far in the chat. Uh, but yeah, if anyone has questions, feel free to type them in or unmute your mic. Hi. Okay. Oh, June, do you have a question? Yeah, I, uh, I'm completely quarantined and uh, I'm way older, probably twice your age, maybe three times. So I'm always intimidated about pitching. So, uh, you know, I think about my uh, startup in my mind over and over again, but I don't pitch out loud. Um, I feel <laughs> like I need to um, have a schedule and say, I'm going to pitch this three times a day out loud while I'm walking around the house or something like that. That makes total sense. And you'll see one of the biggest things I advocate for is just practicing just like that you know, record it and play it to yourself. Just say it as you're getting ready for whatever you're doing. If you're walking the dog, if you're taking the garbage out and just, yeah, just keep saying it to yourself. So you get practice and you get comfortable with even having those words leave your mouth. Um, yeah. And then you just escalate it in different ways. So you can then practice in the mirror, practice in front of someone, practice with a pillow, whatever it is, right? But I think yeah. you have the right mentality. You just got to start. You just, just do it. Even if it's not perfected like nothing becomes nothing's perfect the first time right so just oh, start saying what you think you would put in your pitch you know what I mean yeah um absolutely in fact I'm making an appointment uh to pitch in 10 days to the 
local um, uh, investor group. And this is really giving me a lot of ideas on preparation. So thanks so much. You're welcome and good luck. Thank you. Happy to. So Jaleesa, I see two questions in the chat. Uh, I'll read them out to you, but I have a feeling you're gonna address them in uh, your actual presentation. Don't worry. Uh, the first one is from Kim. Do you have a scripted template for pitching? Yes, I do. Um, so what I do, and it's fine, I, it's, repetition is great. So what I do is in my um, presentations, on the PowerPoint in the notes under each slide, I write exactly what I'm gonna say. And that comes by kind of what I just told, I think her name was June. Um, I just fill out, kind of think of like when you're in high school, you write an essay, right? You just, you do the rough draft first. Sometimes you do an outline of like, these are the things I wanna talk about. Oh, I need to get stats about them, X, Y, Z. So I use the same kind of method for my pitching. So it's like, it looks really ugly at first. I don't have a template or anything. I don't worry about what it's gonna look like. I just say, what information do I need to convey? then I might play around with the order in which I put it in. And you, you start learning which order to put it in by saying it out loud. And I just say it to myself, I just sitting here at the computer, I'm like, Tony Marlowe is da, 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 da. No, that shouldn't come then. And then I just change it around until I feel like, I think this makes sense. And then I'll, I'll say it to someone else and I'll record it and hear it back to myself. And then I'll be like, okay, this would be better in this location, that would be better there. And then you start getting the flow. And once I'm like nailed, I'm like, this is the order. These are the precise, you know, words I want to say. I want to, you know, emphasize this, whereas this I can kind of speak really quickly to save some seconds. Once I have that down, I type it all into the template. And I just, for maybe the first day or two, I just read it. I just read the template. Because as much as memorizing isn't good necessarily it's great <laughs> it's great for for speeches and pitches right because not to get too like you know whatever you want to say woo woo but like the power of the subconscious mind is incredible and what you're putting in is if you keep listening to your your pitch and you keep reading it over it's like a song it's like a show you know what's going to happen and you're you're there you're ahead of it so if you get thrown off it's just like when your song comes on and you go to the drive through you order your stuff and you turn the music back up, you're right back there. So the way I get there is by putting it into my slides and then just practicing. Um, and that gives you the ability to come off your script Funny. as well, right? Um, I do have a video that will play later. I think it's this pitch, I'm not entirely sure, but you'll see, I do that. Like I totally come off script for a moment and, and I can just jump right back in. So I hope that answered the question. Um, uh, we do have one more question. Uh, so what exactly should be included in a pitch? So I know you will be getting to that. <laughs> yeah, um, he's just wondering because it's hard to fit an actual pitch in two to five minutes. It is. What I'll say for now is what you wanna do is get the core items, which we will go over in like detail. And then when you're delivering it, what you wanna do is leave it in such a way that whatever else they want to know, they ask in the q and A. I I think a lot of people forget that generally there's a Q&A portion to a pitch. And with that being said, you know, I could spend the whole three of five minutes talking about, you know, the industry, or I could just give, you know, three key pieces of information. And then by the end of the presentation, they'll have a full picture and each judge has their thing, you know, like for me, I'm like, what makes you different? Like what makes you so unique? That's my thing. Other people that I will pitch and judge or judge uh, competitions with, they're stuck on the numbers. Like what's your, what's your, your gross margin? That's all they want to know. Right. And I just want to know how you're better. So each judge will have their thing and you want to leave it in such a way that they have enough base information to understand what you're doing that in the Q&A, they can ask anything that you didn't get to go into detail about. Uh, it was a little long-winded, but I hope that answers it for now. And I promise we are gonna go into detail on like what all goes into a pitch. Perfect, I think those are all the questions we have so far. Okay, great. So yeah, uh, lessons learned. So AfroChic, um, last year I went to this event. It was really cool, they had Issa Rae and it was just like, it was a really great event. Um, but they also had a pitch competition. And so it was structured that the first 
round, you had 60 seconds and it was a bunch of us, you know, in one of the back rooms, 60 seconds to get through. And then the last one, then it was like, I think probably five again, top five got to pitch for the final round for 5,000 bucks. And it was a two, two minute pitch. So where I messed up here was, um, I just got really passionate about the suicide prevention donations. And I ran out of time, like just a few seconds short, and I forgot to say how I would use the money. And they were really strict, like it was a hard cut. Like <laughs> as soon as it was done, they would just play music if you kept talking, they were not playing. So, you know, everyone, the crowd, the judges, they loved what I was doing, but I didn't say how I was gonna use the funds. And the person that won, I'm really happy that they did win. Um, they had vegan cheese and they gave the, the judges a sample and so you know food usually wins people over um and so i mean at the end of it what happened was one of the judges came and found me in the crowd and was just like i just want to tell you like you're you know what you're doing is amazing you did such a great job but she won us over with the food <laughs> um you know like what do you need and i was like well i'm like i'm so close to you know being sustainably profitable this is the amount i need blah 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 and she's now a mentor and she had invested she's like okay i can give you this much amount towards it what's your what's your paypal and just like that she just gave me some money um even though i didn't win right so that's why i say like you never know who's in the audience you never know what other opportunities can come from it um but yeah as soon as possible remember to say how you make money what you want the money for and um yeah where you'll be putting it if you do win. So almost done this section. There's two more, uh, you know, pitch stories to share. Um, so venture out. That was a really fun competition. Venture out. I'm not entirely sure if they're still fully in existence, but um, it's an LGBTQ2S tech conference. Um, and we were hand selected to do a pitch at their event last year two years ago last year and i was actually in india and we were going to set it up to be virtual before there was you know that was the norm <laughs> and i was like you know what there's going to be a lot of investors there even though there was no set prize it was dragon's den style right so even though there was no set prize i was pitching to investors and there were a ton of investors in the audience and i was like i can't do this over the the, the screen so i came back from india to do it. i came back early i nailed the pitch won the crowd won the judges had tons of meetings contacts zero offers and that was really disheartening because it's like, you're getting all this praise, you're getting all these meetings. Like, it's not even just, oh, you did a good job, hooray. No, it's like, no, let, I wanna take the time, sit down, have a meeting, go through all the details, um, but just still ended up without offers. Um, and so that was a little rough, but, you know, I did outside of having fun and gaining confidence and getting marketing material, as I mentioned, you know, I learned that whenever possible, bring your team on stage with you. A lot of the feedback was like, you know, people were really impressed by that. They really like to see that and to see the people who are behind the brand and doing the work. Um, again, like I said, you never know who's watching and listening. So always do your best. Uh, I ended up getting connected to several people who became really pivotal, pivotal in, um, you know, the journey from there on out and who connected me to things and places and people that ultimately led me to more funding, right? But had I not come to that pitch, had I not done my best, had I just left right after, I wouldn't have made those contacts and we wouldn't have been able to get those steps and, and grow further a little faster, right? And that being said, you know, sometimes the initial loss is just a delayed win. So one of the people I met there also became a mentor and, um, you know, later on that year, she had asked, she had told me to apply for the, um, the Startup Canada pitch. And at this point, I'm disheartened and I'm fed up and I'm like, forget it. No one wants to invest in underwear, especially not for the like queer community, even though it's not exclusively for the queer community, but that's the primary market. Um, and I was just like, forget this. I'll just continue getting grants and just investing our own money and reinvesting the profits. And that's that. But this particular person had been so um, supportive and helpful in such a short time 
that she with her personally telling me to apply because she wasn't the only person who sent it to me but she kept telling me apply and I was like I can't let you down you've done so much for us already like it's just an application fine fine um but the application it turned out was you go to the event and you have a 60 second window to pitch to one judge of many and so imagine this is like eight in the morning I get downtown I'm not a morning person and you get into this room and I'm, I'm not kidding there's about 20 judges in this small room and for for one minute someone keeps coming in and yelling at them their pitch for 60 seconds and they only get to pick two people so each judge only gets to pick two people from their 60 second pitch I literally is over her ear like yelling in her ear because it was so loud and you know I'm really grateful that the the lady they see from MasterCard there she was that judge and she chose us um, along with someone else and so our names went into a hat um, or like a bag and you know I was lucky enough to get my name pulled from the bag which meant I had the opportunity to actually pitch for the money against the rest of the regional leaders because it was a national competition um, and so now I'm freaking out because I'm like, oh my God, this is like the biggest pitch we've done. This is the most money we really need it right now. And I can you imagine I wasn't going to do it. Holy smokes, my name got drawn from a bag. Oh my goodness, you know, stress and excitement. So I'm feeling freaked out. And so I really did the cheesy things. I did the power poses. They work. <laughs> I was there backstage doing the Superman pose, and like putting my arms up and just going back and like you know, doing all that. And I actually felt better after and I felt more calm and I was like, okay, I can do this. I got this, but I was really nervous. Um, and then I went and I, you know, I did the pitch and I, I won, I won. And everyone was, was like shocked because I was a wild card. I wasn't part of the program. You know, I just kind of walked in that morning and, and took it. Um, but I think part of why I was able to win and a, a powerful lesson I took from it was say it with your whole chest. You know, um, they had asked me why, you know, what about other competitors and things like that? And I didn't skirt around it. I didn't say, oh, you know, they, they do a good job, but we're cooler or this and that. I was like, no, listen, other people are jumping on the, the, the pink wagon and they want to be, you know, trans inclusive. They want to be queer inclusive, but they're not. They just know that it's politically incorrect now if they don't. Whereas our brand has always been for the people, by the people and designed literally from trans people products that they need or like you know masculine of center women and like all the different people that we work with it's all community based and that is a difference and you can't replace that and you know and I talked about periods and I talked about like everything and that I think put us set us aside um whereas you know at the beginning of starting Tolly Marlowe I was not as confident or comfortable to do so I'm gonna give a moment for any other questions. Also, I just need to take a quick breather. So <laughs> yeah, so I see a question in the chat from Kareem. So he's wondering how you find your uh, the pitch competitions that you've entered. Is there a tactic that you use? Um, I think mostly I just stay plugged into all things entrepreneurship. So, you know, I'm in an incubator or two, I do as many programs as possible. So things like this, what you're doing now, just how, you know, Don was like, hey, there's this program going on, this promotion going on with Skip the Dishes and Markham. And David was like, hey, also there's grant, you know, available, check us out, here's the website. It's literally that, it's just staying in community, staying connected. Um, I do sign up to some newsletters, um, and when money's involved, they usually put it right in the header so you can see really quickly, or I just skim it. And um, when I need to, to fundraise, like when I'm like urgently like, okay, we, we need to do something and it's not just the regular day to day, at that point in time, I just Google it. I just, youth entrepreneurship grants, youth entrepreneurship contest, uh, female entrepreneurship, uh, Toronto this, black that, queer that, whatever, label society puts on you i just enter that plus grants funding pitch contest and you get a, a good list um you know and then like i said incubators are a great place so i stay connected to mars and oce you know ryerson has many different zones that i was a part of biz start bits which is business in the streets um 
all those types of things. So I hope that answers that question. And I would also say in being passionate and putting your, your, your work out there, people, people who are for you are for you. So like I said, I won this contest because someone told me to enter it. I had gotten the email from Startup Canada and I was like, well, that sounds nice. And I was like, no, some white guy's going to win. <laughs> like, and I just left it. Honest to God, I was like, I'm tired pitching. They're not going to invest in, in me or in, you know, this product just because of what it is. Um, not that there's anything wrong with me or that my product's not great. It's just the way society is set up. And it's really nice to see that change. And I was like, meh. And several people had sent it to me in different platforms, but because that particular mentor emailed me and was like, you need to apply, I did. But the point being that the more you're out there, the more people will make sure, you know, that you know things and, and you get connected. Okay, oh, sorry, is there one more question? Uh, so Junior's, Junior's just wondering if you have any pitch decks that you recommend, you may be discussing this in, in your presentation. I don't have any particular pitch decks that I recommend. Um, I think you have to use templates that work for you. But in terms of, yeah, I mean, the big question of like what goes into a pitch, um, I don't know if it's still the main thing that's spoken about, but the 10 magic slides from Guy Kiyosaki, um, that's what I was brought up on <laughs> and is, is nailed in my head, right? I, I will show you after I go through these, like my adaptation. Um, so my deck doesn't look exactly like this with like, you know, title number two is problem opportunity, like, no, but I make sure that all these aspects are incorporated. Um, so yeah, I'll go through them quickly. The 10 magic slides are just kind of a, a pretty, kind of a benchmark um, way of putting together your, your pitch decks. So, you know, the first slide should be your title, you know, what's your company name, your name, your title, you know, how can they contact you? Pretty standard stuff. And then number two is the problem or the opportunity, right? You want to entice people. You want to make sure they know why they should listen and give you the time of day. Um, so that's where you're describing the pain, you know, the big problem that you're alleviating or the pleasure that you're providing. And that's the hook, right? Like, oh, tell me more. Um, so then once they're, they're actually listening, then you go on to your value proposition. So you're explaining the value that you're providing, whether it's through the alleviation of the pain or the, you know, pleasure that you're providing. So you know, for us, for Tony Marlowe, um, you know, it's, we provide, we create underwear for, uh, people who redefine gender norms that includes period boxers and packer boxers for women and trans men. And we donate $1 of every product sold to suicide prevention. When I say that nine out of 10 times, people are intrigued and they want to learn more. It can be something as simple as that. And it often is simpler than that. I've tried to make it more concise and haven't figured it out yet. If it works, don't break. If it's not broke, don't fix it, right? Um, so yeah, once you've said your value proposition and like what, why you're better basically, like what you do, you're gonna do, you know, the underlying magic. So that's saying like, what's the secret sauce? Like what makes your product or business better than the other competitors? So in Tony Marlowe example, you know, when we started, I was like, we use bamboo at the time, no one was using bamboo. And I'll talk about why bamboo is great. And I was also talking about, you know, our time of month, our Tom boxers, which are the ones that have the layer that lifts up so you can put a pad with wings in it. And still to this day, we're one of like two, maybe three brands that have that design. So that's what makes us very different. You know, that's the 10X kind of um, component. You definitely want to include your business model. Uh, you got to explain like, you know, who has the money temporarily and how you're going to get it into your pockets, right? So what are your startup costs? Not necessarily going into your financial breakdown, but just like, okay, for mine, it's, we are making the underwear, we're sourcing them here in Toronto, we sell them online, we also sell them at markets, and we do fashion shows, and, um, you know, when we sell into boutique retailers. That's our, that's our business model. Originally, we were going to be a subscription box, so that would have been really relevant in the early days to say we're doing a subscription business model and e-commerce. What's your go-to-market plan? That's your marketing. How are you going to let people know where you are, who you are, what you do, and how they can give you their money? 
competitive analysis again even if no one else literally no one else is doing what you're doing like you know the ipod there was no there was well i guess there was mp3 so when the mp3 came out you could say oh there's no competitor but yeah there was there was walkman discman there was burnt cds there was also whistling and not listening to anything sometimes your competitor is there is no there is nothing else and people are okay with not having a solution at the moment Right, so you just you need to make a competitive analysis. If you go up there and say no one does this, no one is like us, you look kind of silly because most things in the world have already been done. We're just coloring it slightly different shades. Um, your management team. So what I always found interesting when I, when I was in school was how often they would mention that, you know, your market, the size of your market, like your market and your team are the two most important parts of your pitch. Everything else investors feel they can you know help you figure out and improve but if you don't talk about your management team it, they're going to ask in your q a so you don't need to this is a good example you don't have to spend a whole minute of your five minutes talking about your team but you do need to highlight and say this is who they are this is what they do um and where possible or or most important say a little like and this is why this one or two people are awesome um because investors invest in people, um, not always exactly ideas, because there's a lot of great ideas and there's a lot of crappy ideas. And you've we've all seen it. And you're like, how did this person get X millions of dollars for this stupid thing? And then, you know, a few years later or a few months sometimes, you're like, it's a dud. They went bankrupt. They invest in teams more often than anything. Of course, you do need to have your financial projections and key metrics. So you just want to give a sense of like, these are our cost. Um, this is what we intend to sell for. Therefore, this is our profit margin. This is how much we think we can sell in a year. And then in year two, whatever, whatever, these are the expenses associated with it. Um, and then you want to also say like, all right, so we had an idea and we told you about it, but like, this is also what we've done. <laughs> we have our website or we're working on our website. We've done a survey. We've made a prototype. We've written a business plan. We've tested this and the other, or you say, you know what, this is my first step. I've done my research and this is my second action is just pitching to you. I'm really here more for feedback instead of funds. Um, but also more times than not, you're pitching for money. So make sure you explain how you're going to use the money. Right, that's why I didn't win, you know, at AfroChic. I forgot to say what I would use the money for. Right, so just always make sure you can do it, um, or you mention it. So as I said, this is you know kind of the benchmark of how to do, you know, what goes into a pitch. I've adapted it. As you see here, you would say your use of funds at the end. I try to include it in the beginning and at the end, like a sandwich. Like I just kind of say a little mention in the beginning, in a storytelling way, usually. And then at the end, you close with, this is what I'm looking for. This is what I'm going to use it on. So here's my approach. And then you guys can ask questions after this part, because I think if you ask questions on the 10 magic slides, I might address it here. Um, but feel free to start typing them in if you haven't already. So the way that I've adapted it is I always make sure that these eight things go into my pitches. Um, what is your product or service, right? Like and clearly outline it. I've been on panels or judges judging so many times and it's like, it's so vague, like, oh, I do FinTech. It's a, it's an app and you're so hype. And it's like, I love your enthusiasm, but like, do you know how many apps there are? Like, do you, do you really? What does your app do? Why is it different? Like specifically, what does it do? Again, as I said, my example is Tony Marlowe makes underwear for women and trans men, including period boxers and packer boxers. I could just say, oh, it's underwear for women. Oh, it's underwear for tomboys. It's period boxers. Even period boxers is still specific, but you wanna get as specific as possible. You wanna do that as early as possible. Then you wanna also make sure you say how big the market is. As I mentioned, it was always drilled to me, how big is the market and who's on your team? So in terms of market size, you can go by you know, the industry size in dollars or the market in terms of population. I tend to do both. Um, it's just more, it's more convincing and powerful. Um, so for example, instead of just saying, oh, all of North America, you could say something like in North America alone, there are 14 million LT, uh, LGBTQ2S plus people. I also include the fact that those are only the self-identified folk. 
So there's all those people who are undercover and like, you know, living in hiding um, who would be wearing our underwear and don't show up on the consensus. So when you put it that way, like shit, 14 million? I didn't think there were 14 million queer people like in North America. And then you're like, we're living in a global place. And that that's a big market. Whereas when I just say, oh, it's underwear for lesbians. They're like, oh, there's not that many lesbians. It's a small market, right? Um, market research, that is such a key piece. And, you know, I think what makes a more effective pitch is when you weave these numbers throughout your presentation. You'll see even in the 10 magic slides, like there's just a slide for numbers, right? I, I believe in weaving it throughout and making it more of a story. And you will see, you know, my examples in, in action. There's a, uh, I'll show you my pitch. Um, but basically you wanna have your industry research, your customer research, competitors, product details, and yeah, you know, charts, visuals, small details, but put it in throughout the whole presentation. Always, always, as I mentioned, have a competitive analysis. What makes you different? What makes you better and the best? And if you're not being the best, like what makes you the option that people are gonna choose compared to what's currently available? Again, your business model, we already went over that, your financials, your team, and the ask. Um, and again, just to note, like someone, sometimes you're not asking for the money. Like sometimes you're just like, I'm actually here to pitch for feedback. I'm actually here to pitch um, because I would like an opportunity to connect with one of the judges. And this was my opportunity to get in front of them, whatever the case might be. So be clear with yourself. And generally it's a good idea to mention it at the start. So people are primed and ready for whatever you're asking. Okay. Do you guys have any questions at this point? I see one question in the chat from Sachi. So can you give an example of bottom up forecast versus top down? Um, they're referring to slide nine in, in the slides that you discussed. Um, is this one? To be honest, it's been so long since I've used that jargon. I don't even know anymore what bottom up forecast is from top down, totally transparent. Um, that sounds more like a David question. I feel like he might be more uh, up to speed. And again, transparency. <laughs> yeah, I'm putting you on the spot, David. Gotta have yeah, a little no, time. all good. Um, so yeah, so you, when you're doing a top down analysis, essentially, you're kind of looking at it's kind of like to Delisa's example of like, you know, you're trying to figure out what's your target market. So you kind of look at the overall market and you start segmenting down to feel like, okay, well, this is if, if say, if the market is four, $4 billion, what percentage of that is potentially your customer. And when you try to figure and you start narrowing down by demographics and different elements of it, you start taking down that number from that four, four billion to like whatever the subset is. So you take it all the way down and say, okay, well now that's my, that's how I'm going to get my forecast and projection by taking, by going from the top to the bottom. Whereas with the bottom up, it's kind of like looking at our product, doing some initial sales and doing some, some user testing with surveys and be like, okay, well people will buy for like seven bucks. I think I can sell this much in a month, then you kind of just forecast it out. So it just depends. Um, I find that usually in, a, in um, a pitch deck, you'll kind of have a bit of both. You'll see the words like Tam, Sam and all that type of stuff. And that's kind of the people's top down approach. And then they'll have a bottom up approach, which is their financial forecast with their pricing and everything. That's usually in like an appendix or like a detail financial deck. Um, that doesn't get shown because visually it just doesn't look pretty. So most people go with the top down from a pitch deck perspective, but when they want to ask you questions, you probably want to show them the bottom up perspective. I hope that helps. Awesome. It helped me. Thanks, David. <laughs> Thanks, David. I knew the concept didn't have the words. <laughs> yep. So those are all the questions I see so far in the chat. So Julissa, feel free to move forward. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, so as I said, right, if we're using the example of, you know, building a pitch deck is the same as writing an essay, that was giving you the outline, right? Now we're gonna say, okay, well, what's it gonna look like, right? So here's just some visual tips on, you know, putting together a deck. And this is from someone who's not visually creatively inclined, like at all. This is just what I've learned and what I found has worked whether I'm putting the deck together myself or if I have someone putting it together for me after I've given them the content. Um, rule of thumb personally for life, less is more. So 
just period. Less words, less pictures, less graphs, less everything. Um, not to the point where, and I, and no shade or disrespect, but like I did compete against someone whose whole slide was just one word, white font on a black background. And that was it. So you don't want to be entirely minimalist, but really, really go through it once you're done with a fine tooth comb and be like, is this visual necessary? Is it going to be distracting? Is If it's not helping, if there's no clear way, clear benefit to having it on your deck, you should probably remove it. Um, also something I would love to note you know, we were saying, you know, 10 magic slides is the benchmark. I do believe in having as few slides as possible, but I don't hold myself to it has to be 10. You know, between 10 and 15 slides kind of works to get it all in because I would rather have 15 or 17 slides that are visually effective than having 10 slides that are cluttered and become useless. So just to keep that in the back of your mind. So less is more overall, limit the amount of text, use large font, use icons wherever possible. Um, it's a great way to save on space and really clearly get your message across and they're so easily accessible now. Don't use too many colors on one slide or one image. Um, and I know for a lot of creative people or you know entrepreneurs in creative fields, that's really challenging because you wanna make everything beautiful and just so dope and you really wanna stand out and you should do that, but don't get too carried away because at the end of the day, someone can pitch with, with the, you know, just the one word, white font, black background. If their content, if what they're saying is powerful and clear, they're still gonna have a better chance at winning than your beautiful slide that is a bit confusing because there's too much going on and it's distracting from what you're actually saying. So there is a bit of a balance you have to strike and you kind of only figure that out as you keep practicing. You just got to keep doing it, you know, and get feedback, see what works, see what doesn't, and edit it. The best way I have found, you know, this was really cool, uh, I, that when I seen it, I was like, I'm forever using this. You present, say, 10 or 12 slides, but you could have, like, 20. So at the end of your presentation, after the, you know, the thank you slide or the citation slide, you put more slides that are full content slides. So when you get to Q and A, you could be like, oh yeah, actually, and you can show them so that you're not just telling them, right? Because everyone learns differently and the more points of information, the better and clearer it's gonna stay. So if I'm now able to see an answer to my question while you're talking, that's just that much better. Um, so that's one of my favorite tips. Um, these are these four things I think are pretty core. So use numbers as in like actually saying one, two, three, four, as it's written here, instead of writing out the word for the number. Um, yes, that's not always cor grammatically correct, but if you see in the example on the left, like numbers stand out, right? So if you have a whole page of text, if you see an actual number written, your eyes are automatically going to go there. And that's a tip for resumes as well that I learned. Um, use numbers as much as possible because it draws your attention. Excuse me. And in a deck, it also saves space, right? Like writing out the number eight is way shorter than writing it. Sorry, putting the number eight is shorter than writing it. Um, show, don't tell, right? Pictures worth a thousand words. This is our Tom Boxers. You know, how many times have I told you what it is that it's you know, there's a layer that lifts up so you can put your pad with wings. It's period boxers. Half of you probably had no idea what I was talking about. Now you have a picture. I feel like, I feel confident that half of you do know what I'm talking about now, um, if not all of you. So wherever possible, use a picture, a video, an icon, um, a chart, instead of just writing out text. Uh, so color psychology is really interesting um, and you can really spend a lot of time like just learning about it. But one really cool tip that I was gifted with was using green check marks uh, instead of bullet points. So dashes and bullets people are used to um, and it's just generally in the same color. 
whereas green signals to, at least in a North American context, green signals go good, yes, health even, money, right? And a check mark is same thing. It's again, yes, yes, yes. And so that's a way of priming your, your audience to flow towards yes, whatever it is that you're trying to ask for. And it just makes it more engaging as well. Um, and lastly, so this is something that happens a lot and it, it's very interesting that people don't catch it as much, but just make sure that there's readability in terms of the text to background contrast. So I don't know, can you see my mouse? Yeah, okay. So you see over here how it says 1.6 million in that like very awkward green. When we printed this out, that green was not the right color for print and we couldn't see anything. So as much as it was used to emphasize the number so that it would stand out, it actually backfired and it was hard to, to read. And I had to actually like physically outline it in a black marker and you know what I mean? Sometimes you'll see this show up in, you have a really nice picture as the background, but the text over certain aspects of the, the picture is blurry. Like you can't see it because of the background, right? And then you're, you're instead of listening to what's being said or reading the information, you're squinting, you're trying to figure out what does that say? What's going on? Does that make sense? Uh, so I'll show you my pitch deck um, and we can just go through it and feel free to ask questions as we're going through. I'm not going to actually say the pitch. Actually, you know what? I'm going to play the pitch at the same time. Is that cool by with everyone? Mendez, founder of Tony Marlowe Clothing. We make undergarments for people who defy gender norms. That includes period boxers and packer boxers for women and trans men. We donate to suicide prevention on every purchase. But if I'm Jalisa, then who's Tony? Tony is your tomboy lesbian, the girl who steals her boyfriend's boxers every day, the guy who has his period, the non-binary person who packs, and the female athlete who just wants to be comfortable. Comfort, that is why I started this business. I used to wear men's boxers every day, but the legs would roll up. I'd get front and back wedgies. There would be panty lines. And the worst part was I couldn't wear my, my pad. And that problem happened every month. And trust me, fellas, every woman who likes boxers has tried it at least once. It is not advisable to put a pad in your boxers. Until now. So with Tony Marlowe's, hopefully you can still hear me, but with Tony Marlowe's time of month um, period boxers, this layer lifts up. And then you can put a pad with wings right inside your box. You can also check it on Instagram. I'm coming back to the mic. Um, our Packer boxers um, were designed by our co-founder or other partner, Samson Brown, AKA Mr. Gillette. And basically it allows trans guys to wear their prosthesis without a harness or a jock strap. In North America alone, there are 14.6 million self-identified LGBTQ individuals. So you can imagine what that number is worldwide. Outside of the queer community. My apologies. I have a different pitch than what I thought I had up. I'm going to let the video finish playing um, and we can address it later. Um, and then I'll just go through the slides so that you can see how it correlates to the tips I was giving. Does that make, is that cool with everyone? Okay. Yep. Community, our target market are women who are 18 to 45, online shoppers, socially conscious middle income earners who use pads during their period. Our secondary market are women in Asian countries where tampons are taboo. We already have a lot of interest in India and China and a few customers there as well. Some competitors you may know of would be like Thinx or NYX that have really cool products that allow you to just free flow into your underwear. However, there's a lot of people who aren't ready for that yet, including myself and a lot of people in my community. Tony Marlowe allows you to still wear a pad, which is what you prefer, as well as a comfortable underwear made for your body. Um, and other competitors don't offer the Packer boxers and the period boxers, along with we also have boy shorts and bras, we're working on a binder, et cetera. In the last, um, and we're the most inclusive, our sizes go from triple extra small through yum, yummy, yummier, and the yummiest. 
<laughs> in the in the last year, we've increased completely bootstrap, no full time staff or real money. Uh, our sales by sixty six percent. Tom sales by five hundred and seventeen percent. Returning customers one hundred and twenty three percent. And the bittersweet number is requests for out of product sales went up by one hundred and fifty percent. And that means we would have actually tripled our sales last year had we been able to buy enough inventory. The problem is it's too expensive in Toronto and the minimums are too high overseas. And I've never had enough money to make that order. I went to India this year. I have a manufacturer literally just waiting for me to send them the money in the contract. This will make us sustainably profitable. Thank you. Um, okay. Any questions on the, on the video, like on the actual pitch? so far and I'm gonna, I will answer as much as possible, but I think I'm more so gonna kind of pin it and like so that we can go through it with the slides, but um, please, if there were any questions based on that. I don't see any questions so far. Okay, cool. Um, so just going through the slides, just to show you how they, how I implement the tips I'm giving, right? So this is, you know, the 10 magic slides. This is your title, has all the in important information. I immediately tell you what the problem is. In terms of visuals, this is a very good example of who my target market is. This is a masculine uh, female um, wearing boxer briefs. Her head is down. I'm trying to convey, you know, it's not an inclusive space. She's sad about something, right? Um, and then instead of using the bullet points, I've used something else, right? Just to make it more visually interesting and stand out. And here I've given information, I've made it very clear what the problem is, right? I further, like I back up my claim by saying I've done some research and here are some numbers. So immediately I'm giving you numbers, but this isn't gonna be the last time you see it. And again, in terms of showing, right? Like this is one of our models. So you're always getting, um, there's always, um, there's always subliminal messaging is basically what I'm trying to say, right? So it's not just your words. You want everything to flow together. It's the content itself, like the information, it's the visuals, it's how you present it. It all goes together. Again, explaining the, the problem in detail. And while I'm doing that, I'm also talking about the market as a whole, right? So this is, I'm giving you another number here, 14.6 million uh, self-identified LGBTQ in North America. These are the problems they face in the retail industry and fast fashion industry as a whole. You know, this market has been ignored and underrepresented. So then I tell you, okay, what's the 10x? What's the, the secret sauce, right? That's what this slide is. There's our solutions. And again, I'm showing you, there's not very much text on here. I'm showing it to you instead of telling you. Uh, who is Tony? Uh, addresses the target market and this slide is a bit different from you know what would be in the 10 magic slides but this is to help you identify exactly who our target audience is which is important of course um as well as like reminding people why this matters and showing that like actually this market is bigger than you initially assumed then we get to the market opportunity, which is your industry analysis. Again, with the numbers in the market research. So there's several key numbers here um, and there is some text, but you'll see that the most important ones I've put at the top. Um, and then I have it here for reference, depending on time or the audience, I can speak to one aspect more than another. If I'm in a fashion area, I might talk about, you know, it's a 7% decline in sales and thongs versus if I'm at a tech place, uh, a tech conference, I'm gonna talk about, oh, we know, you know, e-commerce is growing as 42% of e-commerce is clothing, right? So it's just giving you that space to adapt your pitch to your audience. And then you use, use the basics, use text in terms of, you know, bold, italics, underline, highlight, the things that you want to really drive home um, because no one's gonna be able to read everything on your slide and listen to you at the same time. So you wanna just make sure you're drawing attention to the most important parts. Um, again, specifically saying who our target market is, it's always good, I shouldn't say always, but I find it's, it's beneficial um, if you have the time and the space to do it concisely and clearly to include a secondary target market. People won't always understand your, your first target or they might feel like it's uh, too small. Also, sorry, I'm just noticing my dog has come closer and is snoring. 
Are you guys hearing that? Do you need me to move him or are we still okay? We're still good. Okay, cool. Um, competition. Some people push back on doing, you know, charts for a competitive analysis. I'm personally a fan. I think it's very efficient. You can see all the information, you see the logos of everyone. So you know what space you're competing in and you look for what the checks are and you know who might be the biggest competitor. Um, and that's how I've personally done it. Again, in terms of you know, color psychology and, and using icons, we've highlighted Tony Marlowe in green. Normally people highlight in yellow, but no, we want people to think green, go, money, successful. We actually are somewhat uh, eco-sustainable. Like we use bamboo because it is more sustainable and things like that, right? So having all those associations, um, you know, business model, pretty straightforward. You can make a fancy chart or you could just put something this simple. It's really up to you. And it also depends on your business. Some things you're gonna have to have like a very complex flow chart. And depending on your audience, it's gonna make total sense really quickly. So you just have to understand your, your business and industry and your audience. In terms of marketing, again, showing, not telling. Like this is us on the runway. We do media, we have events. Obviously we have a website, social media. Um, and while they're seeing these images, you know, I can talk about it in depth or I could just skip over it really quickly and they can talk about it in Q&A because for a lot of things, something as simple as clothing, it's kind of obvious what your marketing channels are. Um, and what you might want to do is talk about something interesting about how you market or where you market. So here's where I will say, you know, as much as people are shopping online more with underwear specifically people still want to touch it feel it make sure it's the right size so what we like to do is go to the fashion shows have the events let them buy them in person first and then that's where we convert them to online return customers and that is actually what our plan was and it is what has worked strategic alliances which kind of gives you proof of like you know who's supporting you and the viability and and likelihood that you might succeed. Um, this is, can also be substituted when you don't have a team. So sometimes you'd be like, these are our partners, these are our mentors, advisors, coaches, even if no one else is like actually a part of the business, you can include those people as your team. Uh, summary of uh, media. So this is an example, as well as a strategic alliances, these two slides, um, three actually, including the fashion shows, also show milestones, right? And like what we've done to date um, as well as how we do our marketing. Um, show, don't tell, same thing. I've used this example already, so I won't dwell on it too much. And then again, another way of showing accomplishments. And this all puts goes together as a story, right? It's like, look what we've done. We've done this. It's great. We've gotten this kind of coverage, all with no, no uh, financial investment. It's all organic fashion shows, people want us to come, but we can't because we can't afford it. But we've done all these great things. Look at our happy customer. Look at all we've done in a short time. Hopefully here, you're gonna give us all the money so we can be fully stocked. You know what I mean? And it just builds a whole story, right? Instead of just, if I was just to list these out, you know how boring that would be if these were just bullet points? Like, it'd be so boring. Um, financials, so like I already said, I don't really like doing the numbers. Um, I find it can look overwhelming and confusing. So I found that this was a very simple way to get a lot of information across quickly. You still have to include some charts because the financial people need their charts. Um, and it's important and it's necessary. It's business, right? For the most part, we're doing this for profits. Um, and then of course your use of funds, right? You gotta make sure you explain it. Um, again, I use the check marks. I use this this image of you know her running to show like we're off. As soon as you give us the money, we hit the ground running. We can go do what we got to do. Team, same thing, right? It's just really quickly. It shows you who they are, what they're doing, and I put one line so that if they need, if they pull anything from this slide, is that we're entirely queer at, or POC owned and run, and luckily, gratefully, at this time, when I was doing this pitch, that has now become a positive thing. It wasn't as much when I first started, but it is now. And so that's a key message that should be taken away. And then if there's time, I talk about the fact that Barbara's had her own business uh, as a seamstress and designer for like 20 plus years. And so she's a key mentor. You know, Samson's huge in the trans community. 
etc. Ansa is amazing, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Personally, I leave off with an impact image because I am it's it is basically a social enterprise. Um, and also it's a pitch. You want to move their emotions, right? And so you want them leaving feeling like, oh, if we invest in this company, we're investing in something good, we're doing something good, we're being good people. And it's not just about the money. And it is a money, we are for profit, but there's another side to it as well. Um, and then, you know, smiling people in our products, give us your money, please, and thank you. Look, we're smiling, you're smiling, yay. <laughs> and that's how I, I, I end off. And then I have all these extra slides, I have my references, and then I have more slides at the end as per, you know, their questions. That was a lot. I feel like I was rambling, um, but that's just a thing I always feel like. Um, so can we take a moment for some questions and I can just catch my breath for a bit? Yeah, thank you so much, Julissa, for sharing that. I know there's lots of great comments in the chat about how, how great of an example that is of a, a great deck. So um, they're really loving your deck. Um, so I do have a couple questions here. First one is from Jess. Um, she's wondering, how do you do your research initially? I just Google whatever I'm thinking, whatever I'm not sure about. I, like literally with Tony Marlowe, it evolved from another idea, which was basically to have, it doesn't matter, but it was like full fashion. Um, but I don't have fashion experience. I don't even really care that much about fashion. It was just like, it's a need. And I guess I didn't care that much because I couldn't find stuff for myself, right? Um, so, sorry, I opened the chat and I'm like getting distracted. What I did was I Googled like, how do you design clothing? Cause I had no beeping idea. And I found out in a few minutes that you need what's called a pattern maker. I was like, oh, what is a pattern maker? Where do you find them? Um, and just kind of went from there. And that's really how I do everything. I just Google, you know, when you're a kid and you ask, you were in that phase and you just want to know everything about everything and you annoy everyone around you. You're like, what's this? What's that? Why this? How? When? Why? Do that to Google. Just legit. Just be like, how do you do this? What is that? Where is it? Who do I talk to? Um, and that's where I start. After that, I always do a survey. It might be old school, but I just find it's very effective. I do interviews as much as possible whether they're formal or informal, um, as as quickly as possible, you do get an MVP. I think there's also another word out now, but I don't remember the catchphrase yet. But basically, you just want to get something in front of as many people as possible, as quickly as possible. And you want to keep collecting that feedback. And it's just a cycle. Like Once you start, you just kind of continue doing it. And that's how it snowballs into eventually a business. Um, also another good resource for you know finding for getting research is just joining groups join a facebook group join reddit join a slack channel and just ask questions like hey has anyone else felt this way anyone else noticed this thing yo don't you wish that this and that and you can start super casual like that or you can be formal and be like hey i'm working on this business and da 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 da, da. whatever works for you I do want to mention the consensus in the chat is to not wake your dog up. So <laughs> everyone agrees. Um, but the next question is from Linda. And uh, Linda is having problems finding the right images for her media campaign. Um, she's wondering if you hire models. Do you have any suggestions for that? I struggle so much with that. Anything to do with visuals, I like literally freeze. I just get stuck. Um, you guys have no idea how long I worked on this presentation and the project I, the platform I use like does it for you basically. So I feel you. Um, what I do specifically for Tony Marlowe, yes, we have um, models. They're all just regular people. We have a, a sign up sheet on our website. People DM us all the time. Um, and if you're interested in modeling, you just put in your information and put your, your Instagram account and, um, yeah, when we have, you know, when we have to do a photo shoot or a video shoot or we have a fashion show, whatever the case might be, we just go through it and pick people. And it's, we decide based on, you know, representation is, you know, and diversity and visibility is really a core part of the brand. So it's just making sure we have 
a bit of everybody as much as possible. And it is hard because sometimes you can only show four people and you're like, well, that barely scratches the surface on what people look like, but that's how we go about it. Use your friends, use your friends. Use your friends until you can't. You can use stock photos on, you know, on Splash and um, Burst and there's a ton of different websites that have that. Uh, so we got, I see two questions here from Tanea. First one is, how do you feel comfortable releasing images of your design? Uh, she's aware of IP protection, but are you not fearful of someone stealing your technology? <laughs> Touchy subject for me. Uh, yeah, I've had things stolen from me in the past. Part of, you know, why I didn't continue with proof it. Um, I left, anyways, this is a story for another time, but I feel that it was stolen. Um, the grand idea of it, even with Tony Marlowe, people, other companies do things, people who have bigger platforms do things that we did first um, and all down to, yeah, that double layer. So what happened was I didn't put that out first, even though that was the whole point. And another company released it first and they had, you know, Huffington Post do a cover on them first. I'm like, so everyone thinks they did it first, but it's like, we both did it at the same time. My advice is if it's technology or anything that can easily and quickly be copied, you should consult, uh, you know, a legal team. And most incubators have access to an advisor who would give you better advice. I'm not that person. This is just from my experience. Sometimes it is worth it to just, um, you know, trademark or copyright or put in a, a patent uh, file for a patent. Often you can't get a patent, but it's good to know whether or not you can. I did do that. Um, and I was advised not to get a patent and just launch. And this summer I got an email saying that there's an active patent and I need to stop selling in a certain geographic location. So even when you go that route, it's not going to be foolproof. Um, I think the best rule of thumb is when possible, just be first to market if you have the resources to do that. If you have the resources to fulfill demand and get the word out to make sure that you are ahead of the game. And closely behind that, be funding for your legal team to, you know, patent or, or trademark if needed. Um, I think we should take one more question and then I'll just wrap up the other slides really quickly. Um, we've pretty much gone over everything, but just to make sure everyone gets the information in the way that will, you know, land for them. Yeah, the next question is from Tanae again. So what kind of pushback, if any, do you receive from being a solo founder? That's a good question. Um, I don't remember at this point really getting any pushback about that. Probably in the beginning, yeah, it was just like, well, who else is on your team or like, how are you going to do this? But I've always understood um, that you, you don't do anything alone, right? So I've always had people around me in some capacity, um, whether it's friends that are helping, whether it's business partners, interns, whatever the case is. Um, so get creative, use co-op, use interns, use your little cousin, <laughs> like collaborate with someone, you know, if you have similar but different businesses or resources. Um, and over time, you will build your team. Sorry, Julie. So I do want to mention that there was uh, just provided some clarification to our previous question about uh, how you do your research. So she was referring to the survey. Um, so how did you get results from that survey? I just put it on Facebook. I just put it on Facebook. Hey, everyone thinking of doing something, help me out with the survey. I DM'd a lot of people, like I would do the max until Facebook was like, mm, you need to stop. And I would just do that every day. Um, now, the way I do it, um, you know, we have larger platforms and various platforms. So I'll get, I'll put it in Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, uh, Slack, any groups that I'm in, I find are really effective. And then ask other people, whoever, you know, is in your corner, say, hey, can you not only do this, but can you share this with your network as well? And how did you de uh, design your survey? Uh, I used, I used to use SurveyMonkey. Now I use Google Forms. 
Um, that is a whole other workshop that I personally, I find it very fascinating, like survey design. Um, so my suggestion would be talk to Diana and David <laughs> on what resources are available in terms of, you know, finding uh, tools for, for constructing it well. Because you want to, yeah, you want to make sure it's short, it's clear, it's not biased. Um, this is another example of like less is more generally. Um, Perfect. So I think you can get back to your final slides and then we'll approach uh, the last questions that we have in the chat. Okay, sounds good. So yeah, a lot of this now is going to be again, just kind of repetition, but it might be useful to see it in this way. So that was, you know, we went over a lot on like the content that should be in your pitch. We've done some visual tips. Um, I've given you the example with my pitch. Um, so just these are like some key tips in terms of giving an effective pitch from the speaking presenting perspective. Um, always be telling a story, right? The title of, of today was storytelling and pitching. They go hand in hand. Um, and I hope you could tell from the pitch. I can't, I don't know what the volume was like, but I was always trying to tell a story through it. And sometimes in pitches, I'm telling a side story <laughs> while I'm telling the doing the pitch, depending on how much time you have, right? So just that's a really important thing is tell a story of this is where I was, this is what I want to do, these are the trials and errors, these are the things to celebrate, here's some stats, here's some of this, but make it like a story, make it personal when possible. Again, like I said, you saw in the deck, you know, I said if I'm in a tech conference, I'm going to talk about the e-commerce stats. Whereas if I'm in a fashion, you know, conference, I'm going to talk about the fashion-related stats. So just personalize it to your audience. Um, again, the engaging part: leave them wanting more, make them curious. Use eye contact. I have extra tips on doing that if you don't like to, but eye contact is important. You want to connect with people, especially if you're pitching for money. Who wants to give money away to someone they don't feel close to in any way they don't feel like they know your body language is important you need to be confident you know stand straight try your best not to fidget i'm saying this is someone who constantly fidgets try your best not to stand behind the podium i do all the time but you if you're gonna do that be confident about it so i try i try not to lean on the podium even though i generally am leaning always so you want to stand strong you want to make yourself big if you use your hands, go for it, but don't overdo it because it can be distracting. When possible, take up the whole space. So just move from one side of the stage to the other. It's just a way of commanding the audience um, and keeping the attention on you. Um, like I said, do those power poses, do them beforehand. Um, they help you just to feel good. And my number one thing is just rehearse, 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 rehearse. No word of a lie. I record it on my phone and I play it back and I keep doing that until I get one that feels good enough. And I, no joke, I'll just listen to that for like 48, 72 hours before my pitch. If I'm in the shower, if I'm cooking, if I'm eating, if I'm driving, if I'm walking somewhere, pretty much unless I'm having a conversation, doing work that I can't hear something else or um, just need a just need a break. I just play it, play it, play it. Sometimes I play it in my sleep. So rehearse, record, um, and that allows you to memorize it so that you're not reading it. Um, and again, for the same reasons, when you're reading something off off the slides, what happens if the power goes out? What happens if your slides don't load? What happens if whatever the case might be, right? You need to know what's going on. Um, you need to know your business and know what, what you're supposed to be saying. Um, I think I've made that clear. <laughs> um, and so a few more of my, my main tips for an effective pitch. Smile. This is one my, my mom a lot was always on me. I mean, she'll see me practicing. I'm not smiling. She's like, smile, smile. I'm like, no, I'm good now. I know you need to smile. This is just the practice phase. But growing up, I just had, you know, resting stone face. <laughs> and it doesn't help you. So just because it's serious business and you really, you know, it's an important day, don't forget to smile. You still have to have fun and a smile is warm and welcoming and encouraging. And again, you wanna be inviting people 
to feel close and connected to you, to feel encouraged, to support you. And what is more welcoming than a smile, right? You want to feel connected and like, you know, human to human. Um, so intonation, project. So in the clip you heard, I, I, I think it was pretty clear, but you heard I left the, the stage, I left the podium, I was no longer at the speaker. But the whole audience could still hear me because I was projecting, I know how to project my voice. Um, that's really important. You're not always going to have a microphone. And sometimes same thing, technology, you might have a microphone and then it's giving you feedback or it cuts out, whatever the case is. So you want to make sure you're always able to project your voice and use intonation and, you know, make it engaging. Don't be monotone. Um, and the other part of that is just like knowing you can do that gives you a, a bit of a confidence boost. Always back up your claims. Put up your stats, your testimonials, your reviews, and then also have your citations ready, whether they're on that slide or at the end. But if you say, you know, we have the best whatever, whatever, show a review of that, show your sales, show something. When possible, bring your product. Remember I said I didn't get that one pitch for two reasons. I didn't say why I, how I would use the funds and I, the other person brought in a sample of their food, right? I did bring the product, but my bamboo underwear is not as enticing as cheese, <laughs> right? So bring your product whenever possible. It makes it more engaging, personal, and it's again, it's another physical touch point. So that's gonna be another positive reinforcement for the, the judges. And then for the audience, they can see it. Again, the show don't tell. Oh, that's what you mean. Oh, it looks like that. And they, you know, they engage more and they're, they're more for you. And it just shows your commitment, you know, it shows you didn't come to play. As much as you're gonna smile, you didn't come to play, you came to win. Um, again, along that line. So what I try to do is bring my business card, a one pager and a sample for each judge. Samples, you can maybe have like one or two so and they can share that out. But for each judge, I give them a one pager and a card. Um, and again, for the same reasons, the one pager gives them information. It's like a condensed, it's like an executive summary of your slides, right? So if they zone out for a minute, they can come back or in between presentations, they can look at that. They don't wanna to talk to the judges beside them, you know, whatever it is. And it's just giving you those little extra boost. Um, whereas most other people aren't giving a one pager unless it's necessary, right? You guys saw that already. Um, and yeah, so this is pretty much it. These are my last bit of tips for any presentation you do. Um, put your speaking notes in the comments of your of your deck, which I mentioned at the beginning. And you saw that I think when I was showing you my slides underneath each slide, I had my notes and it's my actual script. Um, find a good pace. So, you know, it's hard when you only have three minutes or five minutes or two minutes. So you're going to have to speak quickly, but as much as possible, try to find a pace that's comfortable where you're able to get the maximum information out but in a way that can be received. They can hear you and you don't sound, like every time I play that clip, I'm like, oh man, my pace was horrible. Like I can hear how out of breath I was and da, 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 da. But you also notice I finished right on the bell and they understood everything I said, right? So just find a good pace for yourself. Take a pause um, whenever you need it. Sometimes you're gonna do it strategically and sometimes you're just gonna do it to calm your nerves. So an example of where I do it strategically is I'll say, um, you know, the, the important number here is, I think it was like uh, 150%. That's, that means we would have tripled our sales, but there was a long pause, right? And like, so what that does is it lets them hear the last part, lets it register. And then it keeps them, it's the, the engaging, it's the wanting more like, well, what's coming up, right? And then now they're really listening to what you're going to say. So use pauses strategically. Also, sometimes you just need to catch your breath, calm your nerves. So just, it's okay to take a pause here or there. Um, so sometimes, not always, and you have to gauge the audience and gauge the benefit, but sometimes it's okay to just say, I'm a bit nervous and just giggle or not even giggle, drink your water. I'm a bit nervous. Okay, I'm going to start. Um, what this can do is make you more relatable, right? We're all humans. Most people have a little bit of stage fright, even pros. And like I said, like I'm generally pretty comfortable on stage, but that that um, pitch I showed you, I was so scared. I was so nervous. 
Um, and so sometimes it's okay to just say, I'm a bit nervous. And for me, when I've done that, it completely removes my nerves because it's not like I'm hiding this thing anymore. She's like, oh yeah, I'm a little nervous. And now everyone knows, okay, cool, let me do my best. I don't suggest that being your default. I'm just letting you know that if you need to, more times than not, it's okay. Um, and you'll also get feedback from other people saying, never say that, you know, it's like the performer, you know, if you misstep in a dance recital, don't show it because no one will know. I entirely agree with that, but sometimes coming out ahead of time, it helps. Enough on that, that note. Uh, I've already said record yourself and listen to it like it's your favorite song. Uh, in terms of eye contact. So a trick I was given once, you know, the idea of like, imagine everyone naked. I find that a little silly. How would I like focus on anything? Like, it doesn't make sense. But what you can do is look just above people's heads. So from the distance to them, it'll look as though, it'll look like you're looking at them right in their eyes. But for you, you're looking just above. And so you don't have to have that nerve of like, ooh, eye contact. And it's so in, you know, intimate and intense. Um, and that way you get to, again, build that rapport and, feel, and, and appear more confident and comfortable than you are, which is going to be in your benefit. As you see, I'm constantly drinking water. Um, just bring the water with you. Sometimes you don't even drink it, but just having it there can be comforting. And sometimes you need to, you need, you need some water. Um, but also hydrate beforehand, like drink a lot of water beforehand because you don't want to be like getting stuck on your words or just feeling out of breath or just, you know, coughing in the middle of your presentation unnecessarily. And my last tip is beautiful.ai, which is what I have used for this presentation. Um, and I'm not going to actually do a live demo, but it's a really great website um, and it allows you to create presentations without having to do all the formatting. Um, they have templates, but you can also like drag and drop um, each slide template. So instead of having a whole presentation template, you can just have like for each slide. Um, and then it does, you know, it's like Canva, but a bit better in that sense. And it's free, obviously there's paid versions, but I find it's, it's useful. And that, is it. I'm um, always happy to stay connected and support, answer any other questions or connect people where possible. All I need to, all I ever try to remind people is I hate email. I know, you know, a professional in 2020 should love email. But I hate email. As I mentioned, I have ADHD. Email is not my friend, but you can text me. You can WhatsApp me. I will reply. Um, so don't, don't be shy. Um, and so yeah, my information is there and that's my website. You can check us out online. You can also just DM me there. Um, that's pretty much it. Thanks for, thanks for having me and engaging and um, I'm excited for your questions. Thank you so much, Jalisa. Yes, we have tons of questions in the chat. So hopefully we can get through all of them. Um, so the first one comes from Alexandra. How did you research and find a manufacturer and any advice for that? It was hell, <laughs> um, but patience, um, a lot of word of mouth. I had, uh, at one point I had an intern on my team who was just scouring the internet and doing the same thing, just Googling like fabric supplier, manufacturer, this and that, different keywords and just kind of taking the time to just do that kind of labor intensive research. Um, and then again, also word of mouth and being in incub incubators and things like that. So because I, I was in the fashion zone, I was able to have access to pre-existing lists. I was able to get introductions. Um, oddly enough, I didn't actually end up using any of them. Like all the suppliers I've ever used came from my personal contacts, but it was good to know I had that and I could go through that avenue. Actually, that's not true. My, the Indian supplier, I got through uh, information from the fashion zone. And then my local one I got from my friend has a clothing brand. So he connected me to my initial supplier here um, and so on and so forth. Okay, perfect. So next question comes from Garrett and Garrett is wondering, can you share some more information about your web extension? Yeah, um, I'm really excited just website <laughs> it's no 
I-R-E-N-O-W.com and sign up for our mailing list. But basically it allows you to, actually, how about this? And you can unmute yourselves, but has anyone, whether it's before or after everything that was going on with George Floyd and you know the world kind of realized, oh, we should support black entrepreneurs. Did you find it hard to find black owned businesses? Probably. <laughs> um, most people, so I put out a survey and what came back was most people use Instagram, Facebook groups, and then um, Googling black owned and then whatever they're looking for. And then it's directories and then way down at the bottom was apps. So what I understand about people is there's a lot of well-intentioned people, but we're busy, we're lazy, we might care about something, but it's not always going to take top priority. So what I'm doing with this extension is making it effortless. You will be able to just continue Googling and searching for whatever you want as you normally will. And you don't have to remember to put black owned in front of it. You can just say gift bags. And if there's a black owned company that has gift bags, the icon will glow. And when you click it, a list will drop down that you can choose which company you want to check out and it'll take you directly to their website. Okay, perfect. Thanks for that. Next question comes from Cece. How do you know what you have written is good enough for a pitch? You gotta practice. You just, you just gotta try. You gotta put yourself out there. So, you know, play it, say it to yourself, see how it feels record yourself and listen to it and then be like, mm, this sounds great. This sounds not so good. Talk to a friend or advisor and be like, can you help me out? Just like hear my pitch, give me some feedback. Um, and that I find is the best way once you're comfortable with the content, that's where you get to fine tune like specific words, where you pause, what you emphasize, what you kind of rush over. Um, and keeping in mind again like there's no real thing there's no such thing as perfect like you're never going to be a hundred percent ready it's never going to be 100 percent perfect you just got to do it you just got to try and remember how many mediocre people are out there winning constantly just because they did it they tried they went with their half-baked thing and people ate it and gave them money for it so just just got to do it and next question comes from fabiola how long did it take you to get your prototype um, and did you do that with your own capital? And how many did you have to make for your actual prototype? Yeah, great question. Uh, yes, I used my own capital. Um, the prototyping wasn't crazy expensive. Um, it became expensive once we were like, okay, hey, we're going through with it and we're gonna do a small bulk order uh, just cause the elastic band is, you can't buy it in that quantity. Um, in terms of doing the prototype, again, Facebook, I, once I understood what a pattern maker was, I went on Facebook, say, hey, guys, does anyone know a pattern maker? <laughs> and I got referrals from there. And she made the pattern, she sewed it up, and we just kept prototyping. Um, once I, uh, shortly after that, I bumped into um, a friend from, from Ryerson, and he was like, you should go into the fashion zone. And I was like, I don't feel ready. And he was like, just do it, man. Like, just, just do it, just apply. Um, so I got a little more ready. I told them that I was interested. I said, I just wanna, you know, cross my T's, dot my I's, um, but I'm gonna apply. And they said, cool. And so I, you know, I took an extra week just to go over everything. And then I applied. And from there, I was able to access, um, like they have a pattern maker on staff and then I met another seamstress. So between the two, I would get the patterns made at the fashion zone, and then I would take it to my seamstress. Once I was at my seamstress, I found out that she has a pattern maker in her studio who is a entire god. Um, and I haven't looked back. How many prototypes did we do? Uh, too many. And that was a matter of me being a perfectionist. On the one hand, I think it paid off because we really have the best underwear. Like I, I can actually say that now and it's not just me believing in my own thing. Like it legit is the best of this product. Um, not just by my standards, like the amount of different people that say it. And, you know, a big exciting moment was Arlen Hamilton said greatest underwear ever a few weeks, like a month ago. And I was like, oh, so you did like them. Like, whoa, big things. So 
find the balance. What I, what I would say is as much as we did several iterations of the prototype, we didn't let that stop us from pushing out. So we launched while we were still prototyping. We got to a point where it was like, it was good enough and we got pre-orders. From there, we were still like, okay, people who already have the prototypes, where are the tweaks? Okay, people who did the pre-order, what did you love? What didn't you like? And you know, you kept going from there, but we were still selling marketing while we continued to design. Perfect. Next question is from MC. Can you share some tips when pitching to retail stores? And what are those retailers? Um, what do they usually like to hear? Um, so I've pitched, so we're in a couple local retailers, right? Like small businesses, right? Small businesses, right? They're humans, they're people, they're everyday people like us. Um, so just go in there with that in mind and just talk to them, human team, like, hey, love your store. This is what I like. This is my product. I think it would be a great fit. And this is why. And it's like anything else. It's the same as if you're going for a job interview. Like, hey, really love this brand, this company. It's so cool. I loved this thing you guys did in this campaign or that year or whatever. This is what I do. I think we would work well together. What do you think? Let's give it a try. It's honestly the same thing. You're just changing the language and the topic. Um, and just negotiate, like get, bring your products in have um, you know information ready. We can, if you guys want, you can follow up with me later and I'll send over a, a form, but basically kind of like a one pager, you can have like a retail one pager. Um, and they just want to know things like, what are your minimums? What are your, what are the margins? Like how much are you going to sell them, sell it to them for wholesale? Meanwhile, how much are you selling it for? Because they can't sell it for more than what you are. Um, and you can't be undercutting them. Like if I say, okay, you can buy it off me for 10 bucks and I sell it, you know, for 30, but you need to sell it for 40 for it to make sense for you. That you just, that that's rude. You can't do that. Um, I feel like I'm taking up all the time, but I would just say go in with a conversation and the things you need to know is know your product, know what your deliverables are, like how long your lead time is what your minimum order is uh, necessary, what your suggested um, first purchase is, and um, have marketing assets available and be able to train their staff on, you know, selling the product to their customers. The next question from MC is when you first started out or when you are first starting out, where and what do you pitch to your first 50 customers? I think once you know your value proposition, right, you you tell the as short as quickly as possible, you tell the story of like, hey, do you have this like what I just did? Like, did does anyone did anyone want to try to buy black, but they found it a little frustrating? Yeah, cool. This is what I did so that it won't be frustrating. Tell the story and just be human. Be like, yo, and I'm I'm saying yo because like I'm kind of tired now and I feel comfortable with you guys. I feel like we've connected and we've bonded and we're friends now. But it's just like, hey. This is the situation. Do you feel the same? Yeah, look at this cool thing I've done. What do you think? Can you try it out? Um, I've given away underwear in the beginning for feedback. I was like, hey, I have boxers where you could put your pad in them. Like, no way, that's so cool. I'm like, isn't it? And I'm like, do you want a pair? They're like, yeah. I'm like, but you have to do a survey and take a photo for me. Like, okay, cool. And that's it, right? And so you'll get creative. Um, You'll get creative. And next question is, can you shed some light on how you delegate your tasks to other members? It's a skill I'm still working on and it's hard for most business owners because it's your baby, right? It's your brainchild and you want everything to be so perfect and just so, but nothing grows when you do it that way. Um, what I try to do is match, you know, complementary skills. So. If I'm weak in this, but you're strong in that, I'm gonna say, hey, this is the information. This is what I would like it to look like at the end of the day, or this is what I need it to do. I hate, what do you need from me in terms of resources or tools or access? What do you need from me for you to make that happen? Um, and that is what I've found has been the most effective is just making sure you're on the same page of like what's expected and required mutually. And we have one last question from Cody. What did your process in finding an incubator to work with look like? 
honestly, it, I went to Ryerson and they just have all the incubators and I love York as well. My mom went to York. She's a big like, woo, was pretty not happy when I chose Ryerson, but they just have lots of incubators. So it, it wasn't a thought process for me. It was just like, which one would I go to whenever I have a business? Um, and, you know, you guys are lucky enough to have David. He's done amazing things with incubators all over the city from my experience and knowledge. And he's just, you guys are in good hands. So just check one out. Just same thing back to Google, whatever your, your industry is. Like, I remember the last time I seen David was like, there was like a food incubator hub in Markham. I was like, who would have thunk it? But like, now look, Skip the Dishes is like, let's support all the local food entrepreneurs, right? So just Google whatever your lane is, whatever it is. If you do FinTech, say FinTech incubators and then your area and you'll find stuff. Definitely do suggest that. And I think David will put a link out to our Innovation York entrepreneurship resources that we have. We have tons of services and programs for entrepreneurs. Um, and a lot of them are, are virtual now. Um, so it doesn't matter where you are in the world, you can take advantage of all the different programs um, and resources that we have available and um, there's no cost to them. So, so definitely do take advantage of them. And uh, I think those are all the questions we want to go through. I'm just looking at the time. We're almost at eight. Um, but Julissa, thank you so, so much for, for really sharing all of your tips and tricks and, and sharing your deck with everyone and, and really, you know, showing, you know, what you do in, in your own pitch. I think that was really valuable. So thank you so much for, for dedicating your time to us tonight. Yeah, thank you for having me. It was you guys have been great hosts and participants, so appreciate it. And I do want to thank all of our attendees for attending our, our last session in the fall series of Founder Fundamentals. Um, I'm really excited to announce that we are relaunching the series um, next year. Um, so we are going to be relaunching it with a number of fresh topics. Um, so it, it is going to be really, really great for you to participate and attend. And I do want to show you because I do have a slide on all of the, the topics that we do have. Um, so they are fresh new topics, some we are bringing back. Um, and I do encourage you all to register. We are going to have these events posted on our website very, very soon. Um, but this is just to give you an overview of what we will be offering in the series. And I know that some of you joined us a bit late in the series and you weren't able to take advantage uh, of attending at least nine sessions to get the Innovation York certificate. Um, so this is your next chance to earn your certificate. If you do attend nine, again, you will receive that certificate of completion. Um, so we are starting off on in January on the 14th. Um, it'll be the same time from 6 to 8 p.m. Um, so of course, if you, if you do have anyone else who is interested in the series, please do share that with them. I also do want to take a moment to thank everyone who has helped us launch and really build the series. I want to thank David. I want to thank our partners at the Markham Small Business Center um, and the entire team there. Um, everyone was really, really helpful in helping us put the entire series together. Um, I want to thank you all for attending. Um, it, it's been a really, really great run. Thank you all for attending from around the world and joining us. And hopefully um, you can join us again for our next round of the series um, where we have all these really, really great topics and speakers. Uh, David, Don, I don't know if you want to say a few words since this is the last one. I'll quickly go and just say thank you. Thank you to everyone who's been coming on. It's been crazy that we've been hitting over 100. Never expected. Thank you, Jalisa, for capping off. I, I felt like you you gave such great kind of personal advice. A lot of the stuff that was given, given what kind of, you know, could come from your passion and the way that you were telling it came from directly from your experience. And I think that was extremely important. I see a couple of people asking about certificates. We will follow up with an email on all the details on the certificate. So don't worry, we just have to do some cross-referencing on the back end. So give us some time on that. Um, but just want to say big thank you to Julissa and big thank you to Don for supporting us. Um, there's going to be a couple of new programs that we have coming out. So please sign up for the newsletter. And Don, I know, has a couple of grants that he's going to be launching as well. So I'll let Don kind of jump in there. Thanks, David. Uh, actually, you know what? I, I just want to thank the person who doesn't often get thanked, and that's Diana. Um, amazing job hosting. Uh, I'm so impressed with how you keep things on track, keep the questions on, on the flow, and um, just the interaction with the audience. Uh, it's, it's been great to do this collaborative effort with York University, and uh, City of Markham continues to look forward to support and, and 
uh, promote the types of programming that uh, are really making a difference for a lot of people who are are looking at entrepreneurship and and in the early stages of entrepreneurship. I think this this series, the other programs that uh, Y Space and Launch Y U have been working on, are, are just going to be amazing resources going into 2021. So thanks uh, York University and thanks to Anna. Thank you so much. Really excited to relaunch the series next year. Um, so hopefully we'll, we'll see you all back again for that, that launch on January 14th. Um, and I do wanna remind you to complete the survey. I did include the link in the chat and we'll be sending that out um, in a, in a follow-up email to you all. Um, just a reminder that we have recorded the session tonight and it will be posted um, early next week on YouTube, uh, on our Y Space YouTube channel. Um, if you have any questions, you can also email us at launchu.ca, um, sorry, at launchu at yorku.ca, and uh, you can also visit our website. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us, and I wish you a happy and safe holiday, and hope to see you again back in 2021. Take care.